So Todd, what got you interested in biology? Oh, I've always been interested in biology. I can't remember a time when I wasn't. I remember, you know, three, four years old, going to the Brookfield Zoo in Chicago and the, the Detroit Zoo and being pulled around in a little red wagon, you know, with my parents and looking at all the animals. Uh -huh. It was amazing. And it was just an amazing thing. And I just sort of knew there was always going to be these kinds of creatures in my future somehow. Todd, when we walk around a zoo like this, I mean, the first thing is just the beauty of all of these creatures, but that beauty seems to be found in that diversity. There is just so much uh, difference, uh, a beautiful difference in all those creatures, and yet there's something similar about them. As a biologist, what do you see when you see all of these creatures? Yeah, when I look at these lions specifically, I'm seeing cats myself and you know all the other cats they have here at the zoo and they all have this underlying catness to them that's really apparent it's really apparent when they start playing right you're seeing them lick themselves and clean themselves or you're seeing them playing with some sort of ball or something and they look they're just like a cat they look like <laughs> a cat i mean this uh -huh. is like kittens play around and they do that sort of thing and so for those kinds of things the scientists would put that into a family called felidae. And I would understand the felids to be representatives of a single created kind. So the continuity, the similarity there is so significant that I'd say, yeah, these guys have all descended from a single pair of critters that was on the ark. And that eventually generated all the different sorts of cats that we have today. Well, Todd, how do we get all of that diversity? The yeah, other cats, but they look different. Yeah, they definitely look different. That's a good question. Where do we get all this diversity? So for an evolutionist, of course, they would argue that it's natural selection and many years of mutations and changes. But for a creationist, I'm looking at this thinking, these designs are already built into whatever cat came off the ark with Noah. And over time, then, those characteristics have been expressed as the cats have dispersed and spread out over the world. Just like we see in dogs, yeah, all kinds of dogs. How does that? Dogs are a great analogy. I mean, in only a few hundred years, we've taken essentially a wolf-like creature and turned it into all these crazy breeds, the Chihuahua and the St. Bernard and the German Shepherd. And I think that's kind of what's going on here with the cats. There's, within that cat that came off the ark, those two cats that came off the ark, they had all the potential necessary to generate the various forms of cats that we have today. It was just a matter of breeding it out and dispersing the, dispersing the cats around the world. And as they went then, then you have the lions and the tigers showing up later on. So originally the, the cat and the original dog, uh, they, there was a lot of potential then within them, but Huge genetic potential. potential? Huge genetic potential, all programmed inside of these critters, mm -hmm. just waiting to come out. So that over time in the, in the breeding that we've done with dogs, we're basically just kind of uh, separating some of those genes out, is that right? Yeah, yeah, so, so there's that, all that potential that's in the dog kind, in the dog genome, whatever it is, mm -hmm. that gets expressed as we sort of tease out different parts of various genetic traits and combinations, mm -hmm. you get Dalmatians and whatever. Uh, that's the same sort of thing that's happening here with the lions. So rather than just uh, an, a random accident, it appears as if all of these different species are coming from a really elaborate <laughs> design. Oh, absolutely. And it's not just a design like God you know, designed and created the lion. It's God created something that could make a lion. Mm -hmm. So it's more like you know, a multi-tool or a Swiss Army knife where you got all these pieces that you can just pop out whenever you need them, but it's all just one thing. That's exactly what I think God mm -hmm. created cats to be like. You have these traits that can come out when they're needed. Uh, we can see some of these variations come out even today. So you take a, a lion here, you cross it with a tiger, you'll get a liger. But that thing will be much bigger than either of its parents. So those are traits that come out. And the beautiful thing is, even amidst all this variety and variation and generating diversity, you can still end up with this cat, right? So you end up with a liger that's a real cat, it works. You know, it, it's not like these are broken things or degenerated things. They're the real deal. The amount of design that we're talking about here is just way more than just God making one critter fit for one place. It's making a critter that can make other critters that are fit for 
places that we've maybe, maybe not even encountered before. And it's huh. just an amazing design. It's so much bigger than what we used to think of as design. Huh. Okay, so we have cats and dogs as kinds. What are some other examples? Oh, there's lots. There's the, the sea lions that we looked at this morning. We've got grizzly and polar bear. They're members of the bear kind. Mm. Duck swans and geese members of the duck kind. And now the dogs are really interesting. So in Russia, they did this experiment where they tried to breed foxes to be more tame, right? And they ended up with these foxes that looked like little dogs. The oh. ears started to droop and they started to bark, which is really weird. And so just oh. by breeding them for a single trait, you can end up making all sorts of other weird changes in the, the appearance of these dogs, which I think is another great example of how, you know, the traits that we think of as defining a species are really, they're all embedded into different members of a single created kind. So those foxes actually were still carrying that dog kind within yeah. them, weren't oh, they? Oh yeah, that's, that's the amazing thing. How does this happen? <laughs> that's a good question. How does it happen? We, we, we don't really know. Um, one of the things that we can tell is when we're looking at the various genomes of dogs, we see that they're chromosomes are all scrambled around and changed up quite a bit. I mean, it's really amazing. And so then you might think, well, maybe that has something to do with how they change and how they differentiate. But then the camel and llama, which are all members of a camel kind, their genomes are almost exactly the same. So even when you think, oh, it must be this, the genomes get scrambled. Nope, there are other kinds which are really different and they don't have scrambled genomes at all. So it's really it's a baffling mystery how, how these various traits end up coming out of an organism. It's just really weird. Well, Todd, that's kind of fascinating now to think about what God was doing when he was bringing uh, two of every kind. What do you think was going on there? Oh, yeah. He doesn't have to bring every little variety onto the ark, so you've automatically got room to spare, basically when you actually do the calculations. And okay, so we don't know exactly how many created kinds there were on the ark, but maybe a couple thousands, and they're small. Most animals are quite small. So you have room to spare, literally room to spare, on the ark uh, with, for all the provisions and, and Noah and his family. And all of that diversity that we have today is built into those two of every kind. So they get off the ark, they start spreading out, encountering new environments, so you get and the rabbit kind, you know, some rabbits move up into the Arctic, and of course, then you get your Arctic hares with their beautiful white fur. Other rabbits are going out west uh, in the U.S. where you have grasslands and the plains, and they're getting really long legs so that they can run really fast because there's not a lot of places to hide. They're also getting coloration that matches their environment. It's an amazing, amazing thing that's all sort of built into that, whatever that rabbit was that got off the ark. So that also then uh, gives kind of a neat uh, picture of when God told the animals and human beings to fill the earth. It's, it's not just fill, it, it's really Absolutely. exploding, isn't you it? Are, it's not just, you know, becoming more of you. Mm -hmm. You know, go make more of what you are. It's a matter of actually filling all the little habitats and niches and environments that we have on the planet. And it makes sense then when we go out and scientists continue to be surprised when we find you know, bacteria living, you know, miles underground, or, you know, we find these weird environments where you'd think hot springs at, at Yellowstone, you'd think there's no way any critter could live in there, and yet they do. So filling the earth, yeah, we filled the earth pretty effectively. But we're talking about kinds uh, that were on the ark. Yeah. People sometimes equate that with species. Can you help us Get those species words right. has a really weird history and, and trying to understand exactly where the species idea came from, when you look into the history of it, you realize it's really coming out of people studying reproduction. People used to think that if you left a piece of meat out to rot, it would turn into flies, right? Mm -hmm. And so this guy named Francesco Reddy, he started doing experiments and realized, no, 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 it's because flies lay eggs on the meat and then the baby flies come from the same kind of fly that laid the eggs on the meat. And so he called those things species, and that led to the idea, well, you know, if species always produce more of the same species, then you go back far enough, you come to creation, right? Mm -hmm. And it wasn't until later in the 18th century that people began to realize it's not really clear what these species are, 
and it's pretty clear that sometimes they can be really variable and sometimes they can even change. And so people began to think there must be another category here that's not the species that God was the original creator of because species can really change in pretty dramatic ways. Todd, I think a lot of people think that uh, the animals that came off the ark were all the animals that we see. They came off the ark and then they just, they stayed that way. But you're telling us that's not the case. No, yeah, the, the ark, the ark pictures and the cartoons with all the lions and the tigers mm -hmm. and, the, and, the, and the zebras and the horses, that is really unrealistic, really unrealistic. Plus Noah looks like us. I mean, he's a white guy. That's very <laughs> unrealistic too. Uh, yeah, the, the ark, you might not have even recognized it, but the cool thing about it is you would have recognized things. You would have said, hey, that looks like a horse. Hey, that looks like a cat. Hey, that looks like a dog. Even though you might not have known exactly what kind of cat or dog or horse it was, but you could have at least recognized, yeah, I know what that is. I can see that that is a member of that creative kind. That's the amazing part. So if we have uh, the horse kind or the dog kind uh, coming off the ark, how can we get so many so rapidly? Is that possible? That's, that's a good question. And when you look at the history of dog breeds, and you can see only in a few hundred years, we can generate all this diversity. I'm not really that worried about generating the diversity that we see in created kinds. I think it's possible. It's just a matter of keep hammering away at it and trying mm -hmm. to understand exactly what's going on there. Because we're just at the beginning now of understanding genomes. I mean, when I was in, when I started grad school, we kind of had a, idea of how genomes and genes worked. I mean, basically, the year after I started grad school was the first genome sequence published. It was a bacterium. So I was there as the genome revolution was happening. It was pretty amazing to watch right up close. And we're just beginning to understand it. We're barely beginning to understand it. By the time I got out of grad school, we discovered an entirely new class of small RNA genes that we didn't even know existed that turned out to be really important for epigenetics and control of gene expression. So, you know, people want to know, well, how do you generate all this diversity so fast? And I think, how do you generate diversity at all? How do you even make mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. features of an organism? We're barely able to answer those kinds of questions right now. And so how do you make it different? Well, I don't think it's going to be that hard. So all you're talking about is there's some environmental things and other factors we don't really know exactly how, but it's possible for all that diversity to happen rather quickly. Absolutely, it's totally possible to have it happen really fast. Now you mentioned the term epigenetics. What is that? Epigenetics, oh yeah. So you have your genes, which are the things that make physical parts of your cells. Epigenetics is the stuff that controls how the genes make the physical parts of your cells. Because okay. you don't want all your genes on all at once. That'll give you cancer. That's bad. So you've got to have some sort of control, some sort of way of making sure that the right things get made at the right time. That's what epigenetics is all about. So it's kind of like a super controlling factor over all absolutely, of this absolutely. potential we were talking and about. And it controls as much, maybe even more, of inheritance from one organism to another when they have babies as the actual genes themselves. There's already a cell there that we call the zygote once the egg's been fertilized. That has a bunch of epigenetic stuff already in it that's gonna guide and direct how the genes are expressed to build a new organism. It seems like this whole genetic thing is like we're just touching the surface of something amazingly deep and powerful underneath, is that, that the is case? That's exactly right. We are we're on the brink, and I love the idea of more Christians becoming involved in this kind of research mm -hmm. and learning more about the genome, because to be on the cutting edge of understanding where all these traits and features are coming from, that's gonna be you know next generation uh -huh. creationism right there. It's a level of complexity that's much bigger than just the simplistic ideas that we have. And we think that we're the ones that are breeding all these things, you know, and making all these different dogs. No, 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 we're expressing things that have been built into that mm -hmm. system from the start. Yeah, how far can we go with that, Todd? That is an excellent question. And to really understand that, we gotta go look at, at the cat that isn't really a cat, the mere cat. <laughs> okay. the He's cat right around the cat. corner here, yep. Okay. The cat that's not a cat. All right, let's, let's go, go check him out. I have to hate to lead you guys. So, the cats that aren't cats, the most popular part of the zoo, right? Uh-huh. So, they don't even look like cats. They look more like little weasels or something. 
And I've made a work effort over the years, doing a lot of research, trying to understand the similarity of these things to cats. And I can show quantitatively using all sorts of fancy mathematics that these things are very distinct from cats. Mm. And I would interpret that as something I call discontinuity. There's a, there's a difference between cats on the one hand and meerkats on the other hand. Um, so they are not the members of the same created kind. They, they're not really related at all. They're separate creations that God made uh, in their own separate sort of kind. So are you saying that we couldn't take a mere cat and breed it with a real cat and get no. something in between? No, you could not make a cat mere cat hybrid. No, they're definitely. Is that that discontinuity different. you're talking that about? That is the discontinuity that I'm yeah. talking about. They are separate created kinds. You're not gonna cross them. You're not going to, you know, breed meerkats to look more like lions. It's not going to happen. They're different. Does that happen across all kinds then? Absolutely. Kinds are separate. Kinds are distinct. All right. They're cute. And they're adorable. <laughs> Thank you.